welcome to the Pharma Forum podcast. My name is Dominic Tyre, and I'm Pharma Forum's Creative and Editorial Director. In this instalment, I spoke to Catherine Owen, who's Senior Vice President of Major Markets at Bristol Myers Squibb, about the future of commercialization and communications in pharma. As part of that, we looked at how she approaches the 19 markets she oversees and the challenges that can present. And Catherine suggests some areas of commercialization she would like to see the industry evolve further. We also talked about her work mentoring the young female pharma leaders of the future, and she gave some tips about how she has approached her own career. You can find more details of this episode, including a download link for the podcast and information about other installments in the series at pharmaforum.com forward slash podcast. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher and Podbean, where you can find and subscribe to it by searching for Pharma Forum. And this episode also appears in an abridged version in the latest issue of our digital magazine, Deep Dive, which can be found at pharmaforum.com forward slash deep hyphen dive. Catherine, welcome to the Pharma Forum podcast. Thank you, Dominic. Great to be here. So it's always, I, I like to uh, start these um, episodes off just getting a bit of background about the uh, the people we're, we're talking to and finding out really, I suppose, what it is they actually do, what what things like their, their job title actually translates to. And of course, you've got a really interesting one, seeing as how you uh, head up major markets at Bristol Myers Squibb. What does that actually involve in terms of your, your current role? Actually, that's a great question. I sometimes look to, look at LinkedIn and wonder what people really do um, with regard to their, their job titles. So let me tell you what, what my job involves. I lead the um, commercial business for BMS outside the US, and I have 19 countries that report in to me. Um, they include most of the large countries in Europe, um, Canada and Japan. And um, we're responsible for the whole of the BMS portfolio in those countries and all of the employees there. And so I spend most of my time talking to my general managers and ensuring that they're all supported to lead their businesses in their countries. And um, my business is valued at just about um, $12.5 billion. And I have about 4,500 employees. Wow. So quite quite an all quite a lot uh, falls un, underneath your the, um, your sort of purview there. Yes. In terms of your involvement in pharma commercialization, how how long have you been um, working within that aspect of of the industry? Actually, quite a long time now. I sort of say twenty five years plus because it allows me to be a little bit vague on the edges. But um, when I came out of pharmacy school uh, in Manchester, I joined uh, AstraZeneca. And as part of their graduate scheme in R&D, I did R&D for about three years and realized that most of the excitement was actually occurring on the commercial side of the business. So I I was fairly briefly in manufacturing and R&D and then I've spent most of my career since then, so 25 or so years in the commercial side of the pharma industry in sales, marketing, market access, global, regional, all kinds of uh, things within commercial, but, but all commercial. So, and uh, clearly, that's covering quite a quite an interesting period in, uh, for the industry. I'm thinking back to um, certainly some uh, the earlier days of my my journalist uh, career within the pharma industry, and you've got uh, that sort of spate of uh, mega mergers, as, as as we used to call them, coming at the mid '90s, yeah. late '90s, and, and continuing on through the early 2000s. You've got the, uh, the first patent cliff. Uh, there's definitely at least another patent cliff has come within that that time frame and uh, some in- interesting shifts in terms of the rise of, of market access. Looking back at that, that sort of 25 years plus, how do you see commercialization in, in pharma having changed during that, that period? Gosh, that's a big reflection. But I'm, you know, just thinking back to the points that you've um, raised there, you know, I think this, if I sort of characterize it into sort of three main pivot points um you know the 90s for for us was all about carrying the bag um and it was the commercial messaging was was very much directed to the physician um obviously i was in the uk at that 
point, but then came to the US and there was, you know, limited patient communication even in the US at that point. Then as we sort of pivoted into the early 2000s and healthcare started to change globally, there was more um, patient cost involvement, um, certainly in the US, and the patient became part of our mix, our communication, as well as payers starting to think through how they could uh, rationalize, if you like, the access to healthcare. Um, I remember in the UK, the the uh, birth of NICE and the whole HTA movement really started in the 2000s. And we really had to think differently about the value of our products and the the trifecta of communication, you know, the, the three M's, medical, marketing, and market access. And then I think in the last sort of five years, the, the globalization of our industry, the rise of uh, social media, the ability for people to understand very quickly um, when products are approved, when products are available, the influence of, of patient advocacy, the influence of of all kinds of uh, other forces now mean that we're so we have to be so omnichannel in terms of our marketing approach. So we've gone to sort of unichannel to tri-channel to omnichannel. I guess would mm. be my my big reflection on marketing and commercialization in the last twenty five years. And just sort of picking up on on one of the points you made there around the globalization. Um, of course, farm has always been to some extent a global in industry, but which specifically within the last five years then, do you think there's been even more globalization of pharma? And if if so, what sort of uh, form would do you see that taking? Yeah, I, I think, yes, pharma's always been a global industry, but it was very much, um, if you were in the countries, um, you know, if you work for an American company like Bristol-Myers Squibb, um, you know, and you were in the UK, you were very autonomous, you sort of did your own thing. And, and what you did in the UK didn't necessarily impact what they did in France or what they did in Japan. It was sort of very unilateral authority. Um, and then, you know, that as conglomerates merged, as you said, and as we sort of started to centralize, look at efficiencies, look at more effectiveness, and understand that our commercial messaging needed to be more unified, we saw, I think, in sort of the mid 2000s, more centralization. And then I think the last five years I mentioned, because literally global media and the ability to tweet, the ability to even use LinkedIn, the ability to use um, Instagram, where decisions that we make in the US are pretty much real time understood across the world. And there's a reaction to that that you have to be aware of. And I think our communications teams have had to really pivot very quickly um, in the last five years to understand that. Um, you know, press releases in 2000 were approved locally because <laughs> it didn't really matter what you said because nobody was really going to find out about it for a month or two. Whereas yeah. now we have to be very cognizant of everything we do and say because obviously it needs to make sense globally. So I think that real-time information um, generation, which is what our industry is all about, has really fostered a whole new way of behaving, um, you know, commercially, broadly, but also very specifically in our communications channels. And uh, as you mentioned, um, communications are so much more instant nowadays. It, it's, um, feels, it feels like a million years ago since I used to get uh, press releases um, via fax. In fact, it was right. about a million years ago. Yes. Um, but does that does that inevitably make pharma communications a bit more cautious? The industry has always been uh, had a, um, a sort of healthy risk averse nature, perhaps. But are communications more cautious, or just is it? A, do companies just take a different approach to to them with that in mind? Actually, I sort of think it's slightly the opposite, Dominic. I think before we were pretty cautious um, about the way we communicated. Um, because it was, you know, written and it was sort of one time event. I think now what we've realized is communicating in real time is, is the way we have to evolve. And so we've become more open to understanding that um, communication is, is sort of a full time job. It's not one press release. It's, it's constant. And so we're able to uh, be a little bit, bit more um, open to different forms of communication, different styles, understanding that um we have to communicate differently to patient groups than we do to payers, than we do to governments, but that they all can see the channels so that our communications have to be clear and they have to be concise and they have to be understood. 
And so I think we're actually getting better at communicating because we have to be more omnipotent and omnichannel. And so we have to be short, sweet, to the point, accurate. Um, and I think it's made us better communicators, actually. OK, that was interesting. And looking at your current role then, so as you say, you're you're covering 19 markets. Uh, it ranges from, I think, um, Japan, Canada, Europe. Yeah. Within that vast geographical spread uh, and mix of um, different healthcare needs, uh, mm-hmm. cultural approaches and, and, and so on, what sort of challenges does, does that present you when you're looking from a, a commercialization point of view? Yeah, no, it's um, it's been a huge learning curve, Dominic. I spent my last sort of 15 or so years in the US, which has its own complications and complexities, but being able to pivot between um, what we need to do in France and Japan and Belgium and Italy and Canada, you know, on a daily basis, honestly, sometimes um, makes my head hurt. So one of the main uh, parts of, of, of this job is ensuring we have amazing leaders and people in those roles and in those countries. This is a truly a team sport and that we empower them to make the decisions and that I really help them be more successful by getting things out of their way, removing barriers, supporting needs centrally here at, at the home office and ensuring that they can do business locally in a way that's appropriate to them. So, you know, my sort of secret to success here is actually having an amazing team who who live and work in those countries and, and empowering them to do their best every day. Mm. I mean, given the, I suppose, given the difficulty or if not the impossibility of learning everything about yes. all the markets that, that you cover. Yes. You, you must have to um, ensure you have the right team you're working with and, and put a lot of trust in them as well, I, I would imagine. A lot of trust. Um, and, you know, having a framework of values within BMS that we all sort of live and work by, our, our six values, um, it's it's something that we all lead within. And um, that trust is therefore easy to give. Um, I've also got a, a great team of seasoned um, pharmaceutical executives. They've got different backgrounds, but all very, um, very accomplished. And so um, for me, it's a it's a joy and a pleasure to have such a, a great team. And uh, trust is, is easy to give when you have um, that framework of values that you all work within. And in, in, in terms of that, that value framework, I mean, briefly, what, what sort of things does it does that cover? Well, it talks about our focus on um, example integrity and and making sure that when we make decisions, we're making them with our patients in mind and making them uh, appropriately and within the ethics and guidance of the country, compliance and and legal rules, but also our our BMS integrity. Um, And we have a strong focus on that, you know, because obviously in the pharmaceutical industry, that's a really important part of how we do business. We also have um, values around innovation and uh, ensuring that we're always thinking differently and making sure we're um, challenging ourselves to be the best we can be and and think about doing business locally in a way that's appropriate within that culture, but you know, innovative and, and pushing the boundaries. So we have uh, you know this this group of of values that we we live and work by that can be translated into the local. Uh, languages and, and and a local sort of culture, but it allows us to all remain aligned on on those key values. So, uh, in, in, uh, in addition to the the current team that that you lead, and uh, in, um, in terms of heading up commercialization, you're also involved in trying to help bring through uh, the next generation of young female pharma leaders. Can yes. you talk a little bit around? how you're involved in in that uh, mentoring side of things. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a part of my role that I really love. Um, So I think, you know, sort of starting back in my career, you know, when I was sort of in the first five years or so in my career, I I looked above me and I looked up and around me to to see leaders who I admired and and leaders who were on a journey that I I, um, wanted to go on. Um, And it was important for me to have those people to talk to. But as a a young female leader in the sort of the late 90s, there weren't tons of women above me, but there were enough to help signpost the way. Um, and I really valued those conversations in a different way than my male mentors, all valuable, but, you know, that we had a different discussion. And um, as, as my career has advanced, I've looked to 
ensure that I'm mentoring women um, around me and and coming up behind me, um, as well as men. And um, but with a particular focus on ensuring that women feel empowered to join our industry, uh, realize how flexible it is and how many different opportunities there are for vastly different careers from finance to marketing to sales to um, market access, R&D, uh, statistics, engineering, manufacturing. I mean, you can pretty much use any degree in the pharmaceutical industry and have a, a really robust career. And so more formally now, Dominic, I, I work with our um, our employee resource group, um, Be Now, which is um, our, our women's resource group, and um, sort of ensure that I'm supporting them, um, talking to to, to groups of women leaders being open to being asked questions and, uh, you know, uh, how did you do it and sharing advice and lessons learned and, and life lessons. Um, but also then I have a more formal role within our um, specific leadership development programs in BMS um, with a colleague of mine, Esther Banke. We lead our general manager development program, ensuring that we're developing our general managers of the future um, we have a diversity and inclusion development program, which I'm helping to sponsor. So different parts of, of our company, different development programs, different leadership programs, as well as actually um, people that I've worked with all over my 25 years who I sort of mentor outside of work um, and still stay connected with. With that in mind, do, do you have any key bits of advice that you would look to, to hand on to um, the next generation of, of female leaders? Um, I try to focus on um, a few key areas of advice when I'm talking to women. Obviously, it depends on their specific challenge. But, um, you know, some of the things that I think are important is thinking about your career in sort of five year spans and not trying to get too ahead of yourself in terms of planning, but ensuring that you you think about not only your next job, but the one after that and what you need to be doing to be successful in both of those roles, which allows you to think a little bit more broadly about the experiences that you're going to need to, to get there. And at the same time, I also like to talk to people about, um, you know, getting the right experiences. So in most careers, there are experiences that are expected for you to move to the next level, but there are also experiences that are um diversifying and maybe differentiating. Um, we all are competing with people at a similar level, at a similar experience grade for that next job. It's not just about Catherine Owen, it's about Catherine Owen in her competitive set. Look, who else are they talking to? So I try to talk to people about making sure you've got, you know, 80% of the experiences that people are expecting, but maybe one or two experiences that are slightly different and actually differentiating and make you stand out. Um, so have you done a, a role that um, involves a different country experience, a different technical area experience? And I tried to do that myself. And um, I found that to be quite a good blueprint for, um, for, for moving on and up is, is those differentiating experiences really make you much more competitive at different points in time. So bringing it um, back to commercialization, I think we've, we've not yet, or certainly not in the recent past, had a, a podcast episode that hasn't looked at uh, COVID and the impact of the pandemic on different aspects of, of either the pharmaceutical industry or of yeah. healthcare more, more broadly. Uh, yeah. So it's probably a little bit remiss given the <laughs> huge changes COVID has brought, not not to look at uh, how it would how it's impacted commercialization. Are there changes that you see taking place that, that are going to, I suppose, stick around beyond yeah. the, the short term of the current uh, environment? Oh, absolutely. Um, so if I go back to something I said earlier in the podcast, it was about the omnichannel approach that we have to have now in commercialization. So making sure your messaging and your communication about your drugs, both um, efficacy and safety, are being um, clearly uh, channeled through the different media and the different channels that we have. But, but essentially, the pharma industry still has a strong reliance on our sales representatives getting out there and our medical liaisons getting out there and talking to doctors and being able to really take them through the data because it's complicated and it's not, you know, just a, a piece of paper. It's it's a two-way dialogue about clinical trials and about safety, efficacy, different patient types. So it's a it's a true conversation that you have to have with physicians. And so, you know, that 
that ability to have live conversations was obviously very quickly uh, curtailed because not only are our physicians um, in hospitals, which were closed down to sales reps, but also they're dealing with patients who were seriously ill. And so they were very um, sidetracked um, during that time appropriately, obviously. Um, And so we had to learn very quickly how to have those conversations in a different way with our customers and at different times. So, you know, you and I are, are talking now via uh, Teams and Zoom and, and such like. So obviously we we moved to that pretty quickly. But we also, um, you know, moved to virtual congresses and uh, virtual advisory boards. Um, we were we had some innovative ways of getting to customers as COVID was starting to sort of ease off a little. We had outdoor picnics in the, you know, outdoor meetings Mm. that we would never have had before. So we've done different things. We've done drive-in meetings where people drove up in a car and, you know, they had a big theatre presentation of of data. So it's, we've done different things. Uh, I don't think that will necessarily last, but I think this, this more convenient now, what we're learning from our doctors is actually talking to somebody at eight o'clock at night for 15, 20 minutes is actually sometimes more convenient for them. So we're going to need to be more flexible. We're going to need to really understand that we're not going to be able to go back to how we were, much more of a hybrid way of working and really understanding how we can be more mindful of our customer needs as they still, honestly, in, in a lot of my countries are um, in hospitals that are shut down and are still very focused on treating COVID. And so clearly uh, over the, the, the course of the pandemic, at least to date, we've had that huge rise in the use of uh, different digital technologies. It's um, provoked a huge digital transformation, I think, in yeah. terms of both pharma and, and healthcare as well. Yeah. From your perspective, what role do you think digital in that sort of broadest sense will play uh, in the future in terms of pharma commercialization? Oh, I think it's going to play a much larger role. I think it's accelerated, you know, maybe by sort of five or so years, if I was to guess. You know, we were going down the route anyway. I mean, let's face mm. it, we're all we're all consuming media basically digitally, um, you know, at, at our convenience when we want it, where we want it, on the device that we want it on. And so we were moving down that path. Um, but I think the acceleration has really made us realize that um We've had to speed up a lot of that. And I think we're, you know, hybrid communication is here to stay. You know, we, we still have to understand that giving medical information to physicians is a process. It's not a one and done. We have to be there when they need us for specific advice on patient types, or reactions, side effects, uh, questions that, that they need immediate um, answers to. And so that digital channel is really good for that. Um, but then a planned a planned meeting that would have been face to face. Now I would say maybe fifty or sixty percent of the time it's going to be digital, and that's fine. And our commercialization teams are very ready to evolve um, because all we we're here to to ensure that our customers get the right information so our patients get the right treatment. And so that evolution is necessary, and we're we're ready. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, finally, Catherine, then I'd, I'd like to look into the future and post, post-pandemic, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and uh, are there areas where you, th- you would like to see further evolution in terms of uh, farmers' approach to commercialization? You know, I think one of the things we've realised, Dominic, is the intersection of, of healthcare and, and government and policy and, and the role that pharma can play in, in global global healthcare, which seems an obvious thing to say, but I think the pandemic has has helped us all realize that it's it's very intertwined. And so what I'd like to see, and we are seeing, is governments now coming forward, instead of being a little bit adversarial and talking to us about drug costs and, and so forth, that the the discussion's changing a little bit. And it's it, you know, for, from certain countries, it's how can we work with you to drive investment into our economies? Um, to build your manufacturing facilities here, to ensure that we're attracting life science um, brains and thinking into our country. And how can we work with you to really um, support a vibrant pharmaceutical industry, which needs to be thriving for our you know, globe to ensure that we're carrying on in the way that we need to in the face of not only pandemics, but, you know, chronic debilitating diseases that continue to go unchecked in many cases. And so, that dialogue with government 
Um, I'm looking forward to that evolving and ensuring that we can play a part together rather than feeling like we're perhaps part of the problem. I look forward to us becoming part of that solution. Well, Catherine, thank you. It's been great to speak to you and it's been a really interesting conversation. So thank you very much for joining me on this episode of the podcast. Dominic, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. And that concludes episode 42 of the Pharma Forum podcast and my discussion with Bristol Myers Squibb's Catherine Owen about commercialization and communications in pharma. You can find more details of this episode, including a download link for the podcast and information about other installments in the series at pharmaforum.com forward slash podcast. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher and Podbean, where you can find and subscribe to it by searching for Pharma Forum. And don't forget to visit our website to sign up for daily or weekly email pharmaceutical news and analysis bulletins and follow us on Twitter, where we are at Pharma Forum. <laughs> <laughs>